In order for you and me to devise some kind of method or strategy to offset some of the events or re a repetition of the events that have taken place here in Los Angeles recently, we have to go to the root. We have to go to the cause. Dealing with the condition itself is not enough. And it is because of our effort toward getting straight to the root that people oftentimes think we are dealing in hate. We are oppressed. We are exploited. We are downtrodden. We are denied not only civil rights, but even human rights. So the only way we're going to get some of this oppression and exploitation away from us or aside from us is come together against a common enemy. I, for one, as a Muslim, believe that the white man is intelligent enough. If he were made to realize how black people really feel and how fed up we are without that old compromising sweet talk, stop sweet talking him. Tell him how you feel. Tell him how what kind of hell you've been catching and let him know that if he's not ready to clean his house up, if he's not ready, to clean his house up. He shouldn't have a house. It should catch on fire and burn down. Beth Ann Hardison has been a tireless advocate for equal opportunity for people of color in the fashion industry. She was one of the few voices who carried the torch from the likes of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King of the civil rights movements of the 60s on racial justice in her industry. Beth Ann Hardison knows about the struggle of people of color in the fashion business. Born in Brooklyn in 1942, Beth Ann also grew up working in the garment district of New York City. She was a top model and is the owner of Beth Ann Management, which she started in 1984. A lifelong campaigner for diversity and representation on the lack of diversity of fashion's runways, its magazine pages and its ad campaigns. Decade after decade, it was Beth Ann's voice that rang out demanding action and equal opportunity for minorities as she worked tirelessly to get the global fashion industry to do better. But on January 6, 2021, there were very different voices of protest shouting. On the 6th of January, 2021, the world watched on with jaws agape at scenes usually reserved for a Gerard Butler White House has fallen action film. We saw the US Capitol breached by an organized swarm of assailants. They erected a gallows and chanted, Hang Mike Pence. No audio, they, the they just cut out, it looks like they, they and sometimes the Senate. Like they just ushered Mike it. Pence out really quickly. Yes, they did. Here's some more footage. This is of an AP photographer being attacked as he covered the riots, he gets shoved around the crowd. Many of the mob were armed, and some were even carrying pipe bombs. President Donald Trump's supporters stormed and breached the US Capitol. Incited by his defiant speech claiming wrongfully that the election had been stolen from him. We will stop the steal. That election, our election, was over at 10 o'clock in the evening. We're leading Pennsylvania, Michigan, Georgia, by hundreds of thousands of votes. And then late in the evening or early in the morning, boom, these explosions of bullshit. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. Then they marched up the Pennsylvania Avenue to Capitol Hill and up the steps, looking to be part of some deluded revolution. They pushed their way past Capitol Police as some of the lawmakers' office buildings were evacuated. Where the fuck are they? 
They broke the glass. Everybody stay down. Washington, D.C.'s mayor issued a citywide curfew from nightfall through the next morning. Let's walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. I want to thank you all. God bless you and God bless America. By the next day, five people were dead and many injured. One wonders if a Black Lives Matter protest group would have been given the same forgiving reception by security and police. Previously in the summer, you had BLM, Black Lives Matter, which was peaceful protesting. You had a couple people, you know, having arguments or, or, or a little fight. But you never, never had what you had, what they did in, on January 6th. When I saw it on my phone, I didn't think anything of it because you know why? Because I knew they weren't going to really do anything to them. But I remember when Black Lives Matter was marching peacefully with signs and children, you know, just marching for equal rights. They had all kind of tactical SWAT. Oh, they had, they were dressed for war. I mean, they had head to toe riot gear, tear gas, all of that stuff you know, and did not once a law enforcement or government official get killed. No, they shot, they shot innocent bystanders and children with rubber bullets, uh, uh, stood out there with a, their, their semi-automatic, uh, well, for them, it's fully automatic rifles and was ready to do whatever it needed to be done. But then when this insurrection happened on January 6th, I watched Capitol Police move barricades, took selfies, uh, you know, wave their batons at the people coming in. Where is it? If that was black people, they would have shot the shit out of our black asses. We'd have been we'd have been bloodstained running down the Capitol. And then you would have saw this great picture of a of a cop holding his his AR-15 in the air with with such a regal stance and the American flag and they just America. Which is a crock of shit. That shit made me so mad. Black, white, cock, doesn't matter. We're all scared. We're living in fear. What is that really doing? What is that really doing? Come on, what are you doing? What are you doing? Sheer numbers of people succumbing to the coronavirus is overwhelming every hospital in northern Italy. The staff are working flat out trying to keep these people from deteriorating further. They're trying to stop them from dying. The 2020 COVID-19 pandemic has impacted every aspect of our daily lives, including the way people create and consume media. And that includes fashion media. Beginning in March 2020, when the first wave of lockdowns occurred throughout the United States, many publications were forced to revisit their production process. Overnight, editorial teams were tasked with producing entire issues via online, with pitch meetings happening through Zoom and photo shoots done virtually. Ongoing COVID restrictions mean that, once again, Paris Fashion Week is taking place in the digital sphere. In the flesh fashion shows, interviews and parties aren't happening. Instead, buyers and journalists get to sit back and watch a series of films via social media. But that wasn't the only obstacle that society as we knew it faced. On May 25th, 2020, George Floyd, a black man, 
was killed in Minneapolis by white police officers. Let me see your other hand. Please, please Ms. Alford. Both hands. Do nothing. Just seconds after approaching the vehicle, rookie officer Thomas Lane pulls his gun and points it at a noticeably startled and scared Floyd. Please don't shoot me, please, man. I'm not gonna shoot please. you, step out and face I'm away. I'm gonna get out of here, man. Please don't shoot me, man. I'm not shooting you, man. Please, man. I just lost my mom, man. There is a brief struggle as the officers push the distraught Floyd into the back of a police vehicle. Seconds later, Floyd is pulled out the other side. Please. Floyd's death sparked global outrage. The anger over the death of George Floyd. As outrage spreads over the killing of George Floyd in the U.S., protesters have taken to the streets around the world. Thousands of demonstrators gathered in London to protest against racism and discrimination. Protests turned into riots. In Los Angeles, hours before a curfew was ordered, the city became a war zone. After attempting to breach television studios, large groups torch police cruisers. It is now the most widespread racial turbulence since the assassination of Martin Luther King in 1968. Over the last three years, we've grown from a hashtag to an international organizing network. We can't peacefully protest in the streets without getting tear gas thrown at us for what? What we've seen over the last four years has been a deep resurrection of the civil and human rights movement in this country. In the 60s, they didn't have social media. Um, they didn't have a militarized police force. Um, they didn't have a prison industry that was 2.3 million people. They're dealing with different circumstances. If I'm going to go out, I'm going on my feet fighting, okay? So for all of that to happen, those same Republicans had so much to say afterwards. But during the whole <laughs> insurrection, they were running like little bitches, but they got tough talking after, you know, weeks later, months later, now they're tough talking and they're like, no, we're not gonna give the Capitol Police any award for what they did. Same Capitol Police saved your life, you know? We lost one who now they can't even seem to pin the murderers on this man uh, who killed this police officer. You know, but if it was Black Lives Matter, oh, they would have had, a, it would have been 50 of us. You, you, it would have been 50. Of, they would have pinged every phone in the, in the, in the one mile radius. And every one of us would have went to jail for that man's murder. But it's different when it's white. Activists were demanding justice, not only for Floyd and the other countless black people who have been killed by police, but also accountability specifically as it related to racial justice and to diversity and inclusion across all industries. The fashion media industry was no exception. Marginalized communities have waited far too long for mere slivers of representation in the media they consume. And when you begin to see in magazines that they are now becoming more inclusive, when you start to see runway shows, you start to see blacks, girls, guys, it begins to remind people that it's okay, it doesn't hurt, it's not going to make you sick, it's not a disease to be inclusive. And I am the founder of Beth Ann Management Company, Inc., and happy to be alive. And to even start Beth Ann Management at 36 North Moore was like pioneer gangster. She was one of the black models that conquered the French in the legendary Battle for Versailles in 1973 that brought models of color to the forefront of American and international fashion. I'm Beth Ann Hardison, 
I'm a winner. She was the recipient of the Council of Fashion Designers of America's Founders Award in June 2014. Thanks to Beth Ann, we are starting to see a change. More models of color are walking the runways and appearing in advertising campaigns and fashion magazines. Because of her tireless work, we are seeing the tide begin to change, and we now see black as beautiful. Please, please join me in honoring the activist, the advocate, the leader, my mentor, and my mom, Beth Ann Harrison. Beth Ann said, Tyson being in the Polo Ralph Lauren ads was a career highlight for me. At the time, I ran my own modeling agency on North Moore Street in Tribeca. Nobody had ever heard of it. One of Tyson's friends saw my son, the TV star Kadeem Hardison, and it reminded him of me. His friend called to arrange a meeting, but I never say yes to anyone right away. I have to talk to them and feel them out, hear where they want to be. The third time we met, I took him on board, and we still work together today. She created the Diversity Coalition, together with models Iman and Naomi Campbell, the voices pushing for racial diversity and racial justice in the fashion business have been loud. I had a, a very special opportunity because I was, I had a model agency and I also, before that, I worked at a model agency and I was very close to designers. Um, and so I think when I would notice things that would happen, my model agency wasn't, it was not a, it was a integrated uh, agency of different races. So it was primarily white, but it had some black kids, a couple of Asian, an Asian couple of Asian kids, a few Latinos, you know, and some mixed kids. But I had uh, the opportunity of watching what would happen. I had successful models, you know, a girl who'd be successful commercially. So I could see how she would be treated and how someone else would be treated. Or, you know, how much money she would make if she did an advertising job and how much a black girl would make. So, you know, you start to recognize things. It had the effect of an electro shock on the industry. By calling out every designer who didn't hire models of color, she challenged the most influential style makers and triggered a new era in modeling. I knew always that if you talked racism, it would affect the industry. When I looked at the January issue of Vogue, I was very impressed. Magazine editors could easily cast no one of colour, but what we see now is so integrated, so diverse, so modern and natural. But now I'm going after details. Did you see that double page full cover with the male supermodels? They're all successful male models, but you should have at least one black model there. Men like Armando Cabral or David Agboji can't be denied. It's just I'm a revolutionary. It's a calling. It's nothing more than a calling. You just basically are the person who's supposed to do it. You don't know, nobody sends you a letter. There's nobody before you that's ever done it before. There's no one before you that even had a model agency that looked like you, that represented who I was representing in competitiveness with my white counterpart. Yes, there were other model agencies that somebody may have owned that may have been of color, but not competing in the time frame that I was. She works with other prominent brands, is a show producer, she is also a filmmaker and is in the final stages of releasing a new feature film about her life's work, titled Invisible Beauty. She became Gucci's executive advisor for global equity and cultural engagement in 2020. She still keeps a few clients that she continues to manage, including Tyson Beckford, and at the age of 78 continues needling the industry on inclusiveness. I find it a joy to bring some energy back to fashion by calling it out, she said. Fashion needs it. I don't think of myself as anything other than just a human being surviving just the life I live. I feel no age. I think what makes Beth Ann such a unique human being is the fact that the love, the compassion, the understanding of people and the business. You know, that woman knows the business of fashion and probably all of entertainment too, just, you know, she she just has a way with you, you know, uh, just the way she talks to you, nurtures you, you know, shows you both sides of the fence as far as what would life be without her, I don't know. You know, it's, it's just different. Artist management, 
relationship that we had, you know? I felt more like her son, you know? <laughs> she felt more like my mom at times. You know, she definitely guided me in, in, in the best direction she, she, she knew how. If you had it all your way, how would the world look? Would it be filled with trouble and sorrow or opportunity and joy? Would we laugh and celebrate or cry and lament? Would we sit and watch each other struggle or leap at the chance to lend a hand and love? Would we? Even with our differences? If you let your imagination run wild, what could community look like? Could it be the place where ideas are born and thrive? Could it offer strength and support? Could it challenge the status quo and take us to new heights? And at those new heights, perhaps clarity, a better view? So now what? Keep it all in your head, waiting for someone else to make it happen? We're waiting for you. You can change things. You have always been a mover and a shaker at home, at school, in your neighborhood. Now let's reimagine the world together as change makers and see how beautiful it can be. But in 2020, after the murder of George Floyd, the voices started being amplified. Whilst there were significant strides taken in 2020, the fact remains that the path to eliminating racial injustice in all forms of business and life, not just fashion, remains a long road ahead. Kind of set this example for the world. You know, we introduced rap music to you. We, we introduced you to what the word cancel culture meant because you didn't know what the fuck that meant. You didn't know, but it was something that we had already been saying for you know years before it became mainstream. You turn on CNN now, they're like, yeah, well, the Republicans say they're not canceling culture, and you know, and it's just things that you have stolen from us, that you continuously steal from us, and you continuously grow off of it. Where is it? You put us in a position where we can't grow. You know, you try to not educate us we find a way to get educated we find a way to make it and you still have your foot on our necks and still you know mistreat us you know um you, you look at the rhetoric that was said by the previous administration which is now you know we're three months we're however long now that that guy's gone you know which i hated that motherfucker. you know i worked for him one time he's a fucking asshole so the thing is, with, with, with what he said, it is so deep-rooted because there's so many dumb, ignorant Americans who have never, never left their neighborhood, don't even own a passport, never traveled, so they have no understanding of what other cultures are, never dated someone outside of their culture, nor had friends outside of their culture. So therefore, these ignorant fucks don't know shit. So if you say some stupid shit like a Chinese virus, they grasp onto it. They listen to it. Word for word, they're like robots. They repeat exactly what the big dummy said. The big orange dummy said this, I'm going to believe it. Well, the president said this, I'm going to believe it. But if you look at this sneaky motherfucker, ah, well, I'm not taking the shot. Nah, nah, nah. This motherfucker and his ugly ass wife went and took the shot behind your back and did not say to you once, Go get you your vaccine. No, he never said that. African Americans represent about 15% of the United States population. And the American fashion industry is no less diverse than the British or French or Italian fashion industries. The lack of African American representation in the New York establishment is striking for a number of reasons. Firstly, the very vocal and active way the industry finds inspiration in African American culture Names like Rihanna, Beyonce, Jay-Z, 
have a massive global influence on trends in everything from music to fashion to street culture. I'm so reckless when I rock my Givenchy dress. Secondly, the buying power of the African-American consumer, which Nielsen calculated as 1.4 trillion in 2020 and predicted to rise to 1.8 trillion by 2024. The fact that it is a basic tenet of fashion in a global world, that the more diverse points of view on a design team, the more broadly relevant and probably desirable the end product will be, and hence the more successful the brand. In multiple interviews, members from areas across the fashion industry, designers, professors, editors, retailers, financiers and communications executives, mentioned several factors, including socioeconomic realities, educational hurdles, the globalization of the industry and fashion's own core sense of itself as an industry made up of outsiders. These have all combined, they said, to create the current imbalance, which exists not only on the creative side, but on every level. Journalists, buyers, merchandise managers, executives. There is an international fashion business with an international norm. And the bad news is that historically, it has been westernized and largely Caucasian. Yet there are signs that things may finally be changing or that fashion may at least be waking up to its own homogenous reality. When Tom Ford, the American fashion designer, took on the chairman's position of the CFDA in 2019, he knew the post he was taking was fraught with issues. It was a US fashion industry challenged for a myriad of reasons. I'm honored to be the new chairman of the CFDA and excited about the opportunities in the future of American fashion the meteoric rise of digital sales channels, oversaturation. But the new it girls of fashion are Instagram influencers. A relentless schedule. Today, Hawkins is taking another step into the future with the brand new Star Court Mall. A reliance on a failing wholesale model. With retail options for every member of the family. Starcourt Mall has it all. European domination fueled by the luxury major fashion group power base of the LVMH and the Kerings. For years, those and other factors had been chipping away at the global profile of American fashion. Ford was determined to make increasing its international profile a major priority of his tenure. When I was asked to take on this new role, I felt a sense of duty to give back to our industry and to support our designers and the American fashion system. He wanted to focus on young designers and on addressing the issue of insufficient diversity across the industry's designer ranks. Once installed in September, he shook up the CFDA board, securing the election of four people of color, Virgil Abloh, Maria Corneo, Carly Kushney, and Kirby Jean Raymond. On June 1st, as chairman of the Council of Fashion Designers of America, Ford sent a letter to the board about its meeting the next day. He wanted the board to address the Black Lives Matter protests against racial injustice and systemic racism in the fashion industry. Almost everyone zoomed in. Michael Kors, Virgil Abloh, Prabal Gurung, and Vera Wang amongst them. Two days later, the statement appeared. Having a clear voice and speaking out against racial injustice, bigotry and hatred is the first step. But this is not enough, listing four initiatives to follow. Those included an employment program charged with placing black talent in all sectors of the fashion business to help achieve a racially balanced industry. But not every idea that had been submitted was included. And not everybody liked the result. I despise the term streetwear. It's a way to kind of like keep certain designers in a certain box. Crazy. Look at these joints right here. I just feel like it's another way to kind of classify this group of like young black designers that are coming in. And a lot of brands, Raph Simmons, Alexander Wang, Rick Owens, they all do sneakers, they all do track pants, they, they all do hoodies and t-shirts. They're not called streetwear brands. It was Kirby Jean Raymond, the designer of Pierre Moss, and a newly minted CFDA board member. 
and I was every day waking up. This was this was a time when you probably remember it. This was a time when you were waking up every fucking morning on Twitter. You're watching. It was a new police brutality case that was yeah. coming out. Yeah. Somebody was being shot on camera. Somebody was being disappeared on camera, or whatever the fuck it was, and it, or being beaten brutally on camera. And it was like, damn, it's like this is like watching black people in a zoo situation. And I was like, and I started comparing the, the modern time to the Odabenga thing, and I created a, crafted a collection around that. It was dark, it was an ugly collection, but it was meant to be. And, um, and I was like, fuck it, we're gonna talk about it in a, in a visceral, but yet cerebral way. And, um, and, then I, and, then, and then I was like, you know what, nah. I was like, you know, I can't talk about race for the first time in fashion so calmly. So like, let's make this a little bit um, more jarring told the media the statement was a watered-down, bubblegum-ass statement that didn't address the issues. It didn't address police brutality and what fashion could do about it. The, the racism that I've witnessed in, in, in the business of fashion and entertainment is, it's a different kind of racism. It's not like blatant, like, you know, the N-word written on the side of your, your house or on your garage or on your car or something that's yelled to you. It's kind of like, it's secretly thrown at you, you know? It's not blatantly obvious, but you know, sometimes the reason why you don't get certain jobs is because of, you know, your skin color. Not so much the way you look, but more so your skin color. More than 250 black fashion professionals calling themselves the Kelly Initiative sent a public letter to the CFDA accusing the organization of allowing exploitative cultures of prejudice, tokenism, and employment discrimination to thrive. You know, there's this old saying, I think from like the 1960s, that's like, don't shop anywhere that wouldn't hire you. We have to continue to think those ways and abstain from places that aren't complying to these shifts and changes. And announcing a more robust plan of their own, focused on accountability. We have to open our eyes, we have to look now. What we have to do now as creatives is think about how many systems we've been buying into and how many of them we can successfully destroy. There's so many different like nuanced conversations that happen around capitalism. And if you look at just the fashion industry alone, like the fashion industry embodies everything wrong with capitalism, is that you have this 1% that controls most of the wealth, most of the resources, most of the means of production, the leadership roles, etc. And Fashion embodies that. They've done what they've done, they've built what they've built, and they have the right to maintain that. But we don't need that anymore. We're stuck in this rut of we have to do things the old way. And the old way doesn't fucking work. Then, Aurora James, the founder and creative director of Brother Veli's, introduced the 15% pledge, which calls on retailers to devote 15% of their shelf space to products made by black-owned companies. There is a real reckoning taking place in America right now in an attempt to confront years of systemic racism in this country. And of course, this impacts the fashion world as well as, obviously, the world at large. It then turned out that another organization, the Black in Fashion Council, was being created by Lindsay Peoples Wagner, the editor of Teen Vogue, and Sandrine Charles, a public relations consultant. Founded to represent and secure the advancement of black individuals in the fashion and beauty industry, a resilient group of editors, models, stylists, media executives, assistants, freelance creatives, and industry stakeholders to build a new foundation for inclusivity. By the middle of the year, when George Floyd was murdered, it allowed us to look at ourselves in the mirror to sort of recognize the racial inequalities that still exist, you know, in America and the world abroad. And us as a fashion industry, what do we do? You know, we project images. We almost give perceived value. And then when we look at ourselves, 
we look at how imbalanced maybe that representation is. Suddenly, the debate was no longer just about systemic racism in fashion, but rather just how far the industry was willing to go to be at the forefront of social change. What systems are you buying into? What are you innovating versus what are you emulating? Fashion's role right now is to observe and come up with solutions for problems. And we control image, but more importantly, we control self-esteem. And I think that's where we can really find our way as an industry is to really think about this new world, this post-COVID understanding of empathy, this post-George Floyd world of understanding of, of empathy and seeing where we fit in to continue to build off those morals that we're collectively and consciously coming into. I needed to reconcile the hurt I was feeling as a black woman and also the fact that I'm a business owner, said James. These two sides of me needed to converge. Days later, she'd made it happen. She used Instagram to spread the idea of the pledge. 15% because it's roughly the share of black people among the US population and tagged nine companies in her post to get their attention. My name is Maura James. I'm the creative director of uh, Brother Rallies and also the founder of the 15% Pledge. To some degree, it's just surviving this year is something that we should all be proud of. I think for me, I am most proud of launching the 15% Pledge and having some of the biggest retailers across the country uh, sign on. Netta Porter, Saks Fifth Avenue, Target, Businesses, she said, were built on black spending power. Sephora and Mad Men were the only original targets that signed on, in addition to West Elm and the US edition of Condé Nast's Vogue. And as of late November 2020, in Style US and Macy's, the largest retailer to sign on. Many people of color have been encouraged by the number of racial equity measures that have been introduced and implemented in recent months. My to-do list for 2021 is like, very expansive. First of all, I would love to be able to go outside. <laughs> um, but above and beyond all of that, you know, continue the work that we've been doing with the 15% pledge. There's an incredible pipeline of Black-owned businesses that we're discovering all across this country. They're so vibrant, they're so incredible, and um, I just can't wait to start seeing them onboarded at major retailers. Reed said of the Black in Fashion Council, as a board member, I'm excited about how much industry support we have had thus far. I admire the mission of the 15% Pledge, which is helping to transform the industry in positive ways. BDG has since adopted a similar 15% Pledge across our lifestyle sites, Nylon, The Zoe Report, Bustle and Elite Daily, from a content, talent and creative standpoint. InStyle and Vogue US have also officially signed on to the pledge. Online channel Fashionista commits to having at least 15% of products featured in our fashion and beauty market roundups to be from black owned, founded or designed brands. There's a change in the air. And I don't, and I don't necessarily think it's because of the, the, the violent acts that have happened to black Americans in America, but I just think that we were already due for the change, and this is probably why we're getting the violent acts. You know, there, there's a, the race that feels now they're not, they're not superior anymore. So therefore now, let's try to kill all the black people that we can kill. And get away with it, you know? And I think that, that that's kind of like what's going on now because they're starting to see that the music, the culture, um, the appearances on TV, there's more and more uh, young Blacks, people becoming successful, and you know, people of color are becoming more and more successful because they're getting a chance for education and you know things that we were denied for so many years. In October 2020, the Black in Fashion Council announced that it has signed up to 70 companies to pledge to raise the percentage of Black employees in both executive and junior level positions. The organization has nearly doubled the number of brands on board since their August launch announcement. The new names span independent labels, Ralph Lauren, Tory Burch, and luxury conglomerates, Capri Holdings, 
the parent company for Michael Kors, Versace, and Jimmy Choo. And also include retailers, Saks Fifth Avenue, Shopbop, and two of the industry's biggest talent management agencies, IMG and The Wall Group. Hearst Magazines, the parent company of Harper's Bazaar, has also joined the list of companies committed to creating a workspace where black people are represented and amplified at every level. Further, Bazaar Editor-in-Chief Samira Nassar sits on BIFC's advisory board. The process has been long, but we are determined to see actual change and progress in the industry, People's Wagner said. Creating a new industry-wide standard as far as inclusivity has never been done before, but it's needed now more than ever. It's easy to get distracted by headlines and breaking news. And we all know the history of the civil rights movement that occurred between the 1940s and 1960s. But I want to cover a few simple facts shown in a handful of charts that show you the brutal truth about racial inequality in the USA today. And greed, power, and exploitation are the driving forces of other kinds of exploitation in our modern society. First, there was Harvey Weinstein, then Jeffrey Epstein, two men so corrupted by their own power and money, they thought it entitled them to sexually abuse any woman or teenager they lusted after. Now, one of the icons of the world of modeling stands similarly accused of being a sex fiend. His name might not be familiar to those outside of the beauty industry, but for decades, Frenchman Gerald Marie, now aged 70, was the super agent who decided or torpedoed the careers of supermodels. He even married one of the most famous of them all, Linda Evangelista. And a number of his past victims are standing up seeking justice. A 60 Minutes global investigation uncovered more than a dozen former models with shocking accusations about him. They say he's a predator who ritually abused and raped young women, including minors. The women, that include supermodel, actor, author and activist Carre Otis Sutton, are now demanding that Gerald Marie be held accountable for his depravity and now courts in the USA and prosecutors in France are acting. Carre and her role model as activist could well be bringing the Me Too movement to the fashion industry. And really when I was told I would be staying at the boss's apartment, you know, naively I thought that might be a really good thing. Maybe somebody saw something special in me. He, he wasn't a a warm, open, friendly guy. Um, it was very business-like. He was very cold. Um, yeah, I felt definitely inferior. I remember I came back after a full day of castings and was cold and felt terrible and went to bed. And it was at some point in the night that I woke up with Gerald on top of me and forcing himself on me. And I did my best to try to fight him off. And I remember a certain moment of, of completely giving up, of being completely terrified and completely ashamed. He held the cards, he held the power. You know, I didn't have a parent to call at that time. I didn't have money of my own. Um, I didn't have, you know, a roof over my own head. Everything was dependent upon him and, and him giving it to me. And looking back, I was, I was a perfect target for so many reasons. One thing for sure, in fashion, just like life itself, it is always changing. The cycles of introduction, rise, decline and rejection cycle through endlessly like night follows day. 
But does anything ever really cause lasting change? Okay, and there you have it. The verdict has been read. Guilty on all three counts. No! Gotta say, to see him handcuffed and walk out of that courthouse like my brother was handcuffed. I told him he had no more power. He's not a control anymore, but my brother is in control. As in the past, we have seen many gestures, but what seems to be missing is a structural change where we have a renaissance of inclusivity, equity and opportunity that becomes the new normal rather than the injustice to rail against. The real justice is when this becomes the norm and not the exception. And this applies to the greater issue of social justice and exploitation as it does to racial justice, diversity and representation in business of fashion, retail, media and modelling, sexual justice climate justice and human rights. We find ourselves sitting here and going through the same thing over and over and over again, you know, talking about these issues. And it really just comes down to the industry. So it's really your time to just do what you need to do. The year 2020 has been bad for everyone. And so far in early 2021, it still is. It's been a year that preyed on the weak and the sick. A year that claimed lives and tested trust. A year filled with division and upended by chaos. It's been a year dominated by staggering loss of life across the world. But it's a world still filled with courage, compassion, and heart. Pandemics occur, they have always occurred and they will occur. It would be really shameful if we don't learn from what we've been through. Amidst tragedy, we learn that we know how to put others before ourselves. Despite resistance, despite pushback, we persisted. This is a world of resilience, a world propelled by the belief that overcoming the impossible is in fact possible. History has taught us time and time again that the periods of the greatest darkness always seem to be followed by periods of brilliant light. The last great pandemic, the Great Plague, was a disease spread through contact with fleas and other rat parasites. The Black Death was a devastating global epidemic of bubonic plague that struck Europe and Asia in the mid-1300s. The plague arrived in Europe in October 1347, when 12 ships from the Black Sea docked into the Sicilian port of Messina. It lasted until 1351. The disease had a terrible impact, generally speaking, a quarter of the population was wiped out. The direct impacts on economy and society were basically a reduction in production and in consumption. The epidemic clearly caused economic effects which brought about the deepest ever recession in history. Consequently, it can be said that the Black Death is the reason the Middle Ages came to an end. The revolutionary effect of the Black Death was the inversion of the land-work relationship the reduction in the workforce due to the high mortality rates made labour a scarce asset. Peasants began to have a certain degree of margin for negotiation, as the rentals for their land grew less costly, leading to an increase in their wages. In short, the conclusion that can be drawn is that peasants' conditions improved due to labour shortages. At the same time as the disease progressed, global demand fell. By this means, cultivation focused once again on the best and most fertile land. Settlements formerly established in less productive land were abandoned, and those lands were turned over to livestock, allowing peasants to eat animal protein and improving to some degree the living conditions of the time. This social and demographic evolution gave rise to the Renaissance a period which is particularly striking in terms of artistic expression, built around patronage and which can be analysed from different standpoints. Just as in the 2020 year of Covid, society had been plunged into depression and sadness, and the general state of unknowing gave rise to many fears. While it may seem incongruous, the plague's reduction in population also stimulated an economic growth. Sadness 
Similarly, the wave of Japanese industries that would rise up out of the rubble of the horrors of the atomic bomb would create many economic miracles. Japanese fashion designers would later send shockwaves through Paris in the 1970s and 80s. All these designers were children of post-atomic bomb Japan, children who knew great suffering and hardship. Then I could sense the several soldiers about my head and moving the debris. And you find that one soldier dug me out. The only place we are able to escape is the river which runs behind our school. Designer Yoji Yamamoto was one such designer. Very long time ago, I was born as a war widow only son after Second World War. Then I didn't know the meaning of family because mother and me, just two, we started. Tokyo was bombed and we, we lost almost everything. And the money, money value dropped down. In fact, we're cutting up the ancient feudal system, substituting the ways of democracy. Now a man who owned nothing in the old days could buy his piece of land and get a deed for it. As Japanese began to consume Western fashion, and then start to make a name for themselves in their homelands of Asia, Japanese designers started to become more prominent in the West, especially in Paris. They are said to have created the Japanese fashion phenomenon and also influenced many Western designers. Kenzo in 1970, Izumiyaki in 1973, Hanae Mori in 1977, Rei Kawakubo of Comme de Garçon and Yoji Yamamoto in 1981 have since solidified their positions, many to world fashion icon status. They were unique because their clothes were definitely not Western in regard to construction, silhouette, shapes, prints and the combination of fabrics. To many experts, they were in fact anti-fashion but their uniqueness always lied in the way they deconstructed existing rules of clothing and reconstructed their own interpretation of what fashion was and what fashion could be. The Japanese designers were the key players in the redefinition of clothing and fashion, and some even destroyed the moribund Parisian definition of the clothing system. But rather than being isolated as deviant, and left outside the French fashion establishment. Eventually, the establishment would embrace them as creative and innovative, and they were given the status and privilege that until then, only Western designers had acquired. It showed that inclusion was possible. So given how bad recent events have been, Trump's supported invasion of the US Capitol, the COVID-19 pandemic, Trump's four-year partial presidency, the George Floyd murder, BLM protests, civil unrest and racial tensions exploding onto the streets of America. It 
has been a bright spot, as never before in the history of America and the rest of the world has the spotlight been shone so brightly on the issues of racial justice, representation and diversity in America. And many in the know are pointing to 2021. Maybe many wrongs may finally start to get righted. Feeling is, you know, whenever there's a moment, yes, people will jump on. But for me, I feel that we need to sort of call out all the different companies. It's not just enough having black models on your Instagram feeds or, you know, in magazines, because that's the norm now. But we need education. We need people behind the scenes who can get a seat at the table. We need, you know, bursaries you know, bus for people. We need to find different ways of recruitment. For me, for this to last, people need to be behind the scenes. It's imperative, you know. Fashion is so sort of based, trend-based, and so cyclical, and you know, what's happening now and what's cool now. But where British folk is concerned, I had Nadine Ejwari, the first black female photographer to photograph a cover, January two years ago. So for me, the conversation just was natural and progresses naturally. I didn't want to wait for things to happen to jump on the bandwagon. And I feel some com you know, companies are virtue signaling and that's the fear, but the, the ones who are doing real work are sort of doing all these things without, behind the scenes and not necessarily telling the whole world about it. The first award of the evening goes to someone who continues to break barriers in the fashion industry. He has a bold vision. He is a bodacious man. He is editor-in-chief at British Vogue. And I don't know if you know this, he was the youngest ever fashion director at ID Magazine before moving on to Vogue Italia, then American Vogue, and then W Magazine. This is a man who understands that the representation of inclusion, of diversity, is not just important, but it is vital in allowing for our shift in the way the culture views beauty. And he loves beauty in all of its forms. So he does that by allowing young people to see a range of tones and colors and shapes and textures. He's created visions that are more reflective of our reality. And the reason I'm out tonight is because, not of all those things, but really because from the very first time I met you several years ago, I could feel your goodness. I could feel your kindness, your support of your friends. You are a beautiful human being inside and out. And I just wanted to be here to support you, to say congratulations. You deserve this award. Everybody, this year's CFDA Media Award in honor of Eugenia Shepherd goes to my friend, Edward Ennenfall. As the first black editor-in-chief of British Vogue, Edward Ennenfall is one of the most influential voices in fashion today. Edward Ennenfall said, fashion has a part to play in this. It occupies a unique place in the zeitgeist and it has a singular ability to shift mindsets. I implore fashion brands, publications and retailers to employ more people from diverse backgrounds. I truly believe this is the only way to affect real change. We need black people ingrained within the infrastructure of the fashion industry. We can't make any more excuses. This is 2020. There is a new generation rising through the ranks and they deserve better. Get to know people from other races. Read books that challenge your preconceptions. Watch documentaries that inform your values. Be curious and do not turn a blind eye when you come across a racist act, big or small. The time to act is now. But the diversity of perspective, that is what drives us forward and not back. The darkest times in human history have also acted as the triggers for times of radical reinvention and renewal. Leaving aside great plagues, wars and other calamities, one could argue that decades of cultural luminosity cycle through every 30 years. 
Take the jazz age of the 20s and 30s, then 30 years later, the swinging 60s. 30 years after that, the great flourishing of the 1990s. Many indicators are now pointing to 2021 and beyond that may well be another watershed decade of change and light. This could be the era when diversity and racial justice finally changes in the businesses of fashion, retail, media and modelling. Historically, recessions have acted as capitalism's sorting mechanism. Weak businesses shrink or fail, while stronger ones expand. But in 2020, the process of creative destruction did not take place in the typical manner because the downturn was the result of a pandemic rather than, say, a financial crash or inflation scare. There were some idiosyncratic corporate winners and losers. Think of the boom in video streaming, entire hotel chains being closed, or cruise liner firms being wrecked. On top of the enormous economic damages of the COVID-19 downturn, the West watched in horror as America began to tear itself apart first with riots following police crackdowns on peaceful protests in the latest wave of the civil rights movement, followed by President Trump's violent insurrection that attempted to overturn the election. And all of this, of course, was underscored by an omnipresent climate crisis. In short, 2020 and 2021 was anything but your standard recession. As businesses control a larger and larger part of our lives, so too are consumers beginning to expect better. What the reaction to 2020 has triggered is greater than the long overdue permanent change on black rights in America, and it seems to be spreading. Could this be the trigger point that causes a pivot for humanity, where more people choose to get up and make a stand against all aspects of injustice? One day on the red hills of Jordan. What started as a renewal in the civil rights movement in America is expanding to a global movement with global players. No longer just lone activists and racial equality groups, it's now young people, corporations, governments and citizens combined. And the focus is no longer on racial justice. It has added existing calls for environmental justice, responsible business practices and overall human rights. Social justice is embedding itself in our daily lives and giving rise to people using the platforms of a new era to be forces for change. The voices are loud and getting louder. They are demanding systemic change across the board. We start with unprecedented and deadly scenes. It's safe to say then, 
that the nature of business is to sail close to the wind. Consumers, governments and philanthropists are responsible for forcing change. But what if accepting that responsibility and accountability became a necessity? violations. The term sweatshop is most readily associated with the manufacturing of clothes in Asia or the subcontinent, and for good reason. Even products boasting the coveted Made in Italy label are still mired in unethical practices. Many reports out of Prato in Tuscany reveal poor working conditions and a reliance on illegal immigrants working 14-hour shifts for below the minimum wage. This demeaning work disproportionately affects women of colour. Workers are routinely underpaid, overworked and underappreciated. Especially given that what they are making are high value items, with prices marked up tens or hundreds of times their production cost. And even among the consumer base there are toxic ideas at work. The emphasis on hyper-consumption and fast fashion leads to millions of serviceable garments being thrown away every year, with companies generally encouraging buying this season's outfits instead of keeping or repairing existing clothing. The industry also has a tendency to venerate problematic figures. But with an increasingly socially conscious consumer base, and in the face of the aforementioned crises at hand, the industry is beginning to take notice. Many of the leading fashion giants are now also turning to clean their houses of the major issues as well, so as to operate in a way that can sustain a healthy future for our species and our planet. Leaders are now implementing sweeping change and implementing practices to not only correct some of their past sins, but are going even further to implement a new values-based operating system. See the landing page for the Society Models New York City, a division of elite models who represent many of the biggest names and earners of today. Names like Lucky Blue Smith and Kendall Jenner. For years, our industry has appropriated black culture and black faces in an effort to cultivate an exterior of inclusivity, diversity 
and contemporary themes, all the while providing few actual career opportunities. Their landing page is a bold and clear message that deep-rooted systemic racism of the fashion industry must be eradicated once and for all. It even goes further doing a mea culpa for a litany of sins that the fashion industry has historically been guilty of. Whether idealistically or pragmatically, Gucci and Ralph Lauren are two companies that have realised the importance of real action. The wider concern of sustainability and philanthropy as life or death is at the forefront of this discussion. The current climate is one of desperate innovation. To fully embrace these goals requires the shedding of many of the fundamentals of the industry itself. As discussed earlier, the leadership of the fashion world is facing an existential threat. How will it respond? Smart companies are embracing equilibrium. Equilibrium is a state of rest or balance due to the equal action of opposing forces. Equal balance between any powers, influences, etc. Equality of effect, mental or emotional balance, equanimity. One look at the Gucci website will tell you that here is a company committed to much more than profit growth. Their bold announcement of equilibrium is a new standard for an industry with whose past misdeeds are legendary. Gucci have taken the initiative on embracing diversity and sustainability in the fashion world, and everyone is noticing. As well as the renowned Beth Ann Hardison as an ambassador, the mega brand have proved their commitment to diversity and equity within their ranks is more than an empty platitude. Gucci released a multi-stage plan to combat inequality in the company. Taking on Beth Ann Hardison is a clear demonstration of their commitment to these updated ideals. See how beautiful it can be. Hardison is a sincere figure of change and her hiring at Gucci shows that they are serious about diversity and inclusion. My attraction to Marco Rosari wasn't my attraction to becoming a brand ambassador to, with uh, Marco Rosari as much as it was Marco Rosari's attraction to me. Because uh, I, I was the one that was contacted and asked to come to Rome. Um, well, first of all, let's just put this right. I'm an old school Gucci lover. Beth Ann, a true change maker, is also a close personal friend of Ralph Lauren, who has shown a similar commitment to her ideals. Ralph was definitely. Their offices. One only need look at these two beloved brands to witness this remarkable shift, Ralph Lauren and Gucci. Both are brands that Beth Ann Hardison has had an impact on. Beth Ann worked with Ralph Lauren himself over her career and now counts him as a close personal friend. Ralph Lauren, holding hands with a small African-American child whose eyes were filled with wonder, walked the steps down the Bethesda Terrace in New York's Central Park 
to attend the very special celebration to mark his 50th year in fashion. You inspire us to be elevated to a higher sense of beauty, And you do that because of who you are. We are in the heart of Manhattan Central Park. In many ways, the fashion capital of the world. We have the most amazing show that will take you through 50 years of his life and the dreams he has believed in and has shared with people all around the world. Yes, I was there. Yes, I was there. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. He, 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 he made sure I got a personal invite. He made sure I was dressed for the occasion. And, you know, we, him, me, and his wife took this great picture that I have, which that to me was so important that, you know, he, I wasn't forgotten. And even in the documentary, he made sure it was a block of the Tyson era, you know? because it was just, it meant a lot to myself, him, the corporation, and I, I feel like it meant a lot to the world too, you know, for that strong black image. Not to say that he didn't have images before of black men and, and black women for, uh, for, you know, his adverts. It was just, there was something that was carved out in stone and in history that can never be replaced. I've always associated Ralph Lauren with a kind of timeless elegance. His take on fashion is not stuffy, it's not too high, but it makes you feel good while you wear it. What I, I took from that was Ralph has always been for the people. He's always, especially for us brown people, he, he's not a fool. He realizes what's going on in society. Uh, the racism, the, 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 the not recognizing people, indigenous people and people of color for what they brought to the situation. Like Ralph knows a lot of his, his support is from the African American community, the, the, the Latin community, the Asian community. He's always been the person that's been diverse throughout the whole um, establishment of, of, of Ralph Lauren Polo. He's never swayed from it, he's never shied from it, he was never, he's never been afraid. Ralph, love and respect, man. Thank you so much for having this amazing evening. 50 years of history is pretty extraordinary. He's always been so extraordinary. He really is the epitome of the American dream. It's so surreal to be here in so many ways. I mean, you're sitting next to Anna Wintour and Steven Spielberg, Robert De Niro and Oprah and Pierce Brosnan. I mean, it's just as, as surreal as it gets. Inside the underpass, transformed by Persian rugs and painted walls, the designer greeted his family, his wife, Ricky, and three children, then walked past Steven Spielberg, Oprah, Robert De Niro, and Pierce Brosnan, where he came upon Beth Ann Hardison. He was visibly overcome with emotion, shedding tears as he hugged Beth Ann with the warmest embrace. No, I didn't say anything. I just put my hands out. He just came to me. I didn't say anything. People say, there's something you said at one point in his ear. And I told the kids, I said, I said, come on, stop crying. You're getting my dress wet. But it was a joke. Yeah. I just put my hands out. Because we have history, you know, we know each other a long time. So for me, it was such an overwhelming moment too, because I knew who Ralph and I was. All those important people there that he had to shake hands and say hello to, and all the fancy, shiny people. I knew that he and I knew where we came from and who we were. You know, we, we've been around each other a long time, way before Tyson was born. You know, so the idea was that I knew that at, when he saw me, we had this thing that we know what this meant, this whole show. We know how long, I knew him when he made, when he was he was just doing ties, you know? So it was very important. So that's why he came to me, because it was like he just needed some, I think he just needed something to hold on to while he, while he had his emotion. <laughs> when Ralph Lauren 
went past all the celebrities, uh, all the big name people that were invited and went to Beth Ann Hardison, who, you know, is my manager at the time. And they had such a emotional embrace. It was just like, I, I didn't hear what was said. I don't know uh, what either of them said to each other, but the emotion, the, 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 the tears, the, the, the passion, it, it was it was really good to see that you know and for her to be a small business owner black woman in america in such a big industry i mean she had her little agency for the longest time and it competed against the fords the wilhelminas the imgs but all of those people being there to vice presidents, the presence of all those things. He went straight to her. And that embrace had the whole room just in an awe, you know? Some wondering, who the hell is this woman probably? Others who were icons like a Calvin Klein, you know, or, a, or, or, you know, whoever else was in there really knew what that bond was. Ralph Lauren sees himself as an underdog. He always has. A little Jewish kid, Ralph Lifshitz, a dreamer from the Bronx. When Ralph Warren first found out I was from the Bronx, it was uh, it was really it was really the, the, the beginning of a bond. You know, he came up to me and he's like, "Yeah, you're you know, I, I hear you're from the Bronx." And I'm like, "Yeah," and you know, we kind of started. You know, that's when I knew that the fondness and the bond were was beyond me being modeled for you know said you know, uh, corporation. It was more of, okay, nice. Because there was no one else, there was no other models from the Bronx. He was always ahead of the curve. As Tyson Beckford's agent, Beth Ann got to know and work with Ralph himself to champion diversity and inclusion over many decades. And now she also helps guide the brand of Gucci where CEO Marco Bizzari appointed her a global ambassador as a key advisor in his equilibrium movement. Changemakers, scene one, take 12. We are bringing the Gucci Changemakers initiative to life by bringing it into the real lives of real people. Changemaking does not belong to one group of people. It belongs to all of us. How will you become a changemaker? We are nothing without community. When we apply our creativity to problems around us, we can make the impossible possible. Arts and culture are what make life worth living. That is the magic of our existence. The companies have made statements and commitments to diversity and sustainability in the last few years.